All right, everybody, welcome to part two, class one, landscape painting from beginning to end. Um, we just covered uh, how to use Padlet and how the class works and how I'll present it and how I want you guys to share your work. And now we are going to start working. We're going to get into painting, which is why you guys are all here. So I appreciate your patience. And uh, I hope if you have any questions going forward, uh, feel free to reach out to me. You've got my email, phone number, all that different thing. So just feel free to reach out and uh, let me know if, you, if I can be of any assistance to make things clear. I'm going to go ahead and go over to share screen and we're going to go back to our Padlet page. All right, everybody sees the Padlet page again. This is a very small, this is a little eight inch by 10 inch painting that I did roughly of the scene that I'm kind of hoping to do a paint along. Um, what I'm hoping is that by using something as simple as sky, water, land, and a couple trees, that we will really begin to be able to explore all the opportunities and variables that are within this painting uh, or within this scene. So I have um, under the reference photos and also in the email that I sent out to everybody are the different images. This one I did not email to you. This is the midday photo, kind of the most boring, just rudimentary, just like here are the elements of this scene. Um, it's not as beautiful as it is when you're actually out there and there's herons and bald eagles flying around and deer walking around and stuff. But uh, what, why I chose this for our first assignment, our first paint along, is that it literally has four main elements, sky, water, land, and trees. What I'm hoping from this very first experience is by taking some basic elements, we can realize that we can change the angle, we can edit, we can zoom in, we can zoom out. We can take each one of these elements independently and think about it. My biggest, biggest pet peeve in teaching is when a student says, because it's in the photo. When I walk around and I'm like, so why is that branch reaching across here? Or why is there a brick wall right here in the front that you don't get to get through? Or what, you know, all these different things. I want you guys to literally have an artistic license to just know that everything is only an inspiration. Everything is a jumping off point. Everything is malleable, changeable, editable, and not, don't eat it, but you know, you can edit it. <laughs> um, and that, you know, the same place visited multiple different times gives you very, very, very different scenes. There's something wonderful when you take a photo that you're just like, yes, this is it. All I have to do is copy this and I should be able to make a good painting. But more often than not, we have this. But just knowing that with this, this information, this limited information, this almost dreary, not dreary, but kind of boring setup, I have unlimited options. That's what I want to present to you guys in this first painting, that we can take any of those four elements, the trees, the sky, the water, the land, and they're all changeable. They're all movable. The first thing though that we're going to do is we are going to work on different edits, thinking about the different elements that are within the painting, right? I love this scene. I really do. I mean, it, when I wake up at sunrise, that's what this is. And that's when I go down there and paint a lot. Again, it's only 15 minutes from my house. I know that I'm going to have something probably given to me. I know that I'm looking east. Mount Hood, for those of you in Oregon, are, is somewhere back here. Um, 
but I know that I'm going to get a sunrise. I'm probably going to get some fog because it's a very marshy kind of a wetlands bird preserve. Um, but there's a lot of things in here I don't like. I think this lump of trees is very boring. It kind of bothers me every time. And every scene, no matter what time of day, it's just a lump of trees, right? All of these trees are just little domes. Very repetitive. This creek reminds me of the Nike symbol. It's very clean because it's a man-made uh, little stream, but at least it has a turn. But it is pretty, it's like a canal, right? The grasses are all very uh, flat, and there's not a lot of change of color, at least in some of the paintings, depending on the time of year I go out there. The sky can be kind of flat sometimes, you know, somewhat interesting. There's a bit of a hill back here. There's some fog in this scene. But within that, you can see that a little bit of Queen Anne's lace here. And when I did the painting of it, I'm like, well, that Queen Anne's lace adds at least a little bit of interest. Could add a lot more. I've been out here multiple times when there's a heron standing in there. And that can be really beautiful if that's something I want to get into. Or I could paint birds. Anyways, what we're going to be doing is using this base and altering it to suit our wants, desires, needs, whatever it is. I'm hoping that within this simplistic scene of four major elements that you will see that, oh, I can change these trees. I can cut down these trees. I can clear out areas of these trees. I can move the creek around a little bit. I can change the sky. I can invent more wildlife. I can bring in other references that maybe have a more interesting field. I can look at other references, other photos, and see, are there trees that might be a little more fun? Maybe help me tell the story of this a little more. What if also... All right, you guys see all the photos now? And now this photo? Is it showing this a uh, single photo yes. now? Okay, great. So now I'm just gonna edit it on here. So the easiest way to edit our photos is on our camera and or computer or iPad, right? A great way just to quickly try something is what if, you know, if this was exciting and there's some interest here, you know, I got this interesting sun, even though the camera can't, you know, make sense of that weird color back there. Um, what if I just simply did this? Does that help? Is that interesting? Does that feel like it's helping to tell the story? I don't know, but I might want to experiment with that, right? What if my main focus is that sun? That, setting sun back there you know even though the camera is not capturing it correctly i was out there i was painting and i actually have a little study of this somewhere where i you know i think my colors were better than the camera camera always has issues right to get the beautiful colors in the sky it's going to make the darks too dark in other photos where i get the information in the darks it might bleach out the sky right that's okay because i can make this up so what if I really made it about the sun? You know, maybe put it in. You guys see when I'm moving these, you see those lines going horizontally and vertical? That's called the uh, separation of thirds. Well, that's not really what it's called, but that's what we're going to call it right now, separation of thirds. A lot of times I will actually try to put my focal point into close to where those lines meet up. I don't generally want to put it right in the middle. I like to keep my focus just off center. For those of you who are writing notes, write this, dead center is dead. Okay, dead center, if I move this horizon line, 
right into the middle, it becomes a much less interesting. It becomes very stagnant and still. So what I'm gonna often wanna do is decide, is this a painting about the sky or the land, the water or the trees? I'm gonna to wanna to ask myself that because let's say it's about these gorgeous colors in the sky. Then I'll probably wanna move it up. See, we still get a little bit of the water. We get a little bit of movement. You know, it's a little bit awkward, but there's, you know, if it's about the creek, and that little bit of sky is kind of helpful. I can work on this, right? I can also make it a vertical versus a horizontal. This is very much about the creek. This is about the water. This is about the sky's colors reflecting down and it's so fun just to realize that within this one photo not even a great photo i theoretically have an innumerable or a large number of possible paintings that i could do just by simply getting in there, editing, moving things around, I can really see lots of opportunity, lots of chances, lots of things I can focus on. Sometimes I like to get even more creative and just like, well, what if it's about these trees and that little bit of water? Or yeah, what if it was a long horizontal? Hey, Michael. Yes, sir. What 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 program are you using? This is simply the uh, on my computer. When I click on the image, when I click, when I double click the image, that is what pops up. Is this picture? So I just clicked on this. So then I just go up to the top left and there is, so I don't even know what it's called. It's just the okay. simplest, cheapest uh, manipulation tool on my computer. You okay. know, and I, I can just do this. And the cool thing is that you can save copies. So you're not just destroying your original photo every time you save a copy. So I just go to save, save as a copy. And what I'll often do is just add a one, or something, or A or a B to the end of the title so that it doesn't save over it. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of fun just to do it. So a lot of times when I'm out photographing a scene that I think might make a good painting, I will kind of edit within the camera itself, take a number of photos that I think might get what I want, and then I will take a couple kind of big photos that kind of get the whole scene. And that way I have this ability to come back in and change my mind and edit and uh, reinvestigate different options and uh, ideas. It's just, it's so crazy to me. Like it almost is maddening sometimes when I get a good photo and I'm like, there's five paintings in here. What am I going to do? How do I even choose? Um, and the great news is I can paint five photos. Um, I can just, you know, really experiment. Um, within this as well, there's different filters that I could do, uh, all the different things. Um, you can, you know, kind of experiment with what if, I often too will, when I print up my reference, will actually print up a black and white as well. I find that to be very, very helpful for me. Okay, so if you're good with, the, you know, decent on the computer, you can use, you can use uh, your camera, you can do that within your camera, even within your, if you literally uh, go to your camera, if you have a smartphone at all, and just 
pull up photos, you can edit so much within there. Um, for those of you who are a tiny bit more advanced, one of my favorite editing softwares that is, I think, $2 or $3 is something called Snapseed. Um, they just came out with a new version, which is fantastic. You can just play and experiment, and it's kind of amazing. I've taken some pretty lousy photos and made them into some pretty interesting images using Snapseed. Um, another software that I like, especially for the beginning and the design stage of my paintings, is something called Notanizer. So if you can think of the word Notan, N-O-T-A-N, it is Notanizer. And basically what it does is super simplifies your photo into black, white, or black, gray, white, or black, and two grays and white. And it really gives you, it really breaks down the design. Here is a ver here's an example of that. Michael, can I, yep. can I ask the last photo that you just switched off of? Sure. Is that one in Padlet? Yeah, I'll have to get back. Yes, of the tree, okay. and the water under, I just put it on. Uh, no, it was of the stream, but it's a very tonalist. Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, that should be on the okay. Padlet. And Thank I you. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. I think I also send it in the email. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me know if not. Um, oh, I need to show you guys that too on Padlet of how to actually use the images. Um, so my main go-to, especially out plain air painting, a lot of time is just within my camera. I will take the photo. Um, in my camera, I will do a little bit of editing, kind of figure out what design is speaking to me. I will oftentimes adjust it and get rid of the saturation because now I can make up all these colors. I can really play. I can do a lot um, or I can push the colors and make them really <laughs> crazy. Um, all these different things. And you can do, again, all of this within your smartphone if you have it. Um, but I will often turn up, turn down the saturation, uh, turn maybe up the exposure a little bit and turn up my contrast. And what this does is it begins to break the painting down into very usable, simplified value pattern, right? Can you, you know, if you take this, versus this, right? You can see how much easier it would be to do your preliminary sketch, your uh, drawing, if you will, or for me, I like to do um, underpaintings oftentimes. So I'm just lowering the saturation and pumping my contrast. And all of a sudden, those three, four elements, water, sky, land, and trees, become very obvious to me, right? When I get into my painting, I can, of course, push them. I can, you know, lighten some areas. I can cool some areas. I can warm up other, other areas. But with this, all of a sudden, I can do all sorts of things with, uh, you know, making up my own colors and having a great time. So that's what we're going to be doing next week. This week, my hope is that you do three or four value studies, black and white. You can do it with your pencil. You can do it with your pen. A lot of times out in the field, I actually just use a Sharpie. So I literally have black and I have white. And it makes me really decide what's in shadow or what's dark and what is in light. And I'm just looking for the big elements. I don't often get too, too, too detailed. Um, and I'm looking for the light and dark patterns, the light and shadow patterns, and I'm looking for big shapes that help me to tell the story. So can you guys imagine that? If you drew this or if you had this black and white on your canvas and you had no idea what the colors were, like in the reference, like you've never seen it, how liberating and how much fun that would be to step up 
and just go, you know what? I'm picturing a pink sky or I'm picturing a pink to purple sky or I'm picturing pink along the horizon going up to cool green to a light blue with uh, purples in the corner with, you know, all these things. You can really have so much fun. It's really liberating. And again, that's a lot of times where the poetry comes in is by using our references, using our photos or whatever it is that's inspired us initially as a jumping off point. But I um, mentioned that if you don't have this kind of software, I often mail, email my picture from my camera to myself and then copy it to my Kindle. And I can do all that in my Kindle and probably on iPads, but I don't have an iPad. Uh, but there are a lot of places you can you can do those things or at least the planning part of it. And I usually take my pictures oversized so that I can do just this to pick out exactly what I want to do. Fantastic. And that actually takes me to step two. I'm not sure who was talking. Sorry. I'm only seeing like three or four of you when I have. Uh, it was Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. No, that is exactly right. And that is using this software is new. When I started painting, back in you know I graduated college in 2000 um I didn't know how to use a computer we had a computer lab but I barely touched it I didn't own a computer um I was doing what I'm going to show you here in a, just a second let's go ahead and do stop share I'm going to pop over to our uh There we go. So during the break, exactly, partly, kind of what Cheryl, well, Cheryl, we've even got more advanced. But this is how I used to do it. And this is still how I will do it a lot of the time. Is I just printed up black and white copies of it. Right? Let me, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pin myself so that I'm the focus. And straighten that camera out, don't worry. <laughs> All right, so I should be the primary uh, view on the camera. Is that right? I see your canvases. Yeah, yeah, I, I meant that, yeah. But you're not seeing everybody else. Correct. Let me just set up that camera. I try not to make you too seasick. So there's a couple different ways we can simply do it. And this goes back to my illustration days and tools and tricks that I learned. I feel like I was so lucky, even though I don't consider myself an illustrator any longer, consider myself, you know, a fine art painter or whatever. Um, you know, I paint for galleries, paint for, do commissions and things like that. So I don't, you know, that dragon and everything else that I showed you, I don't do those paintings very often any longer. But what I do oftentimes is simply taking the black and white photo, looking at it, deciding I can do something as simple as this. Right? Like I've got a horizontal. Now it's a vertical. Right? Let's zoom in more. Now it's a, a square format, right? So you can do this in so many super simplistic ways. You know, Can I ask a question, please? Please, of um, course. Is that water behind those trees in the distance? No, it's actually just a band of fog. There is water back there, but I don't, it's such a flat field. I don't believe you can see I, it. I it wasn't on that one. It was on a different one that you could see water. I thought you could see water and I would, so it's all right. right. Chance. And here's the great thing is if you want to have water back there, add water back there. And in fact, the painting that we did in class last six weeks, one of the students just said, oh, that'd be fun if there was water back there. And we just added water. And it was so great. And it made it a better painting. Instead of having this big field behind it, we just changed it into water. So that's what I'm really hoping is that you'll, you know, kind of figure that out. Another tool that I use a lot or just, I just cut these up before class. I just took two pieces of paper, cut, you know, I'd put them together, 
cut two L shapes out. And a lot of times I will just simply do this. And then if I find something, I can just take these down, right? All these different opportunities and options that the scene is giving us, right? So there's lots and lots of ways you can do this. Um, initially for the design of this class, I was going to draw out a number of thumbnails, just little two inch by three inch sketches, which is what a lot of time I will do when I am out plein air painting. I'll just take a tiny sketch pad and simple number two pencil or a, a B pencil, which I prefer a little softer and a little darker. Um, or like I said, just a permanent marker. And I'll just do a number of sketches. So these are, I believe, four inch by six inch panels that I just taped a bunch of them onto a big board. Um, I could do this by just simply having the board and putting tape and dividing my surface into multiple surfaces. Uh, however you wanna do it, you can do it just on paper with a little bit of gesso. Um, I wanna show you some different examples I've done in the past and also kind of leaning towards what we're going to do next week. Um, so this is an example of just some paper with some gesso on it. Gesso is like the primer that turns the canvas white, that when you buy the canvas, it's white. Um, and then I just put blue tape across it and built up four different squares. This is from a previous class where I was talking about high uh, value contrast, meaning very light. Uh, mid value, so there's no brights and no darks, a uh, full value contrast, so he goes all the way from light to black, and a low value contrast where everything's on the darker end. But you can see how I can just take the same design and I can test very quickly. Again, this is just uh, some black and white acrylic paint that I just mixed up, which is what I'm going to do here in just a second. I have a lot of fun doing those. Um, there's a lot of times where I just, you know, this is again from another previous class, just talking about the four values within the landscape. Um, and after I get these value paintings done, and this is what we'll probably do next week, just talking about different color schemes that we can use within, you know, different skies, different colors, different times of day all of that, that we can really experiment with. And these little sketches, I think I did all six of these within an hour in one of the previous classes, just having fun, experimenting, testing, you know, using other references, combining references, and uh, just seeing what happens. So this week, what I'm going to do, and I hope that you guys will do, is I'm going to do a number of variations of this scene with different edits. You know, some where the sky is the main element, some where the water is the main element, some where I really manipulate the trees, because again, I just don't care about this lump of trees here. It's just not interesting to me. Uh, maybe the water's a little, again, I call it like the Nike symbol, right? The swoosh. And it's a little bit, you know, even though I live right next to Nike here in Beaverton, um, you know, maybe, maybe I change the water's angle up a little bit. I'm going to leave my skies fairly light. I could experiment a little bit of, with some different cloud formations and designs. But what my hope is, at the end of today, is that I'll have, let's say, well, let's even see if we can get all nine done. Uh, these will all be acrylics, the ones that are painted gray. The white ones, I'm going to try to do very quickly some wiping away technique. That's, uh, you know, one of you mentioned that you saw me on um, the Plain Air podcast with Eric Rhodes doing a wipe away. So I'll show another technique that I use with oils. These are going to be acrylic, but I could do these in oil with just simple black and white, or I actually prefer doing it with burnt umber and white. I just like that warmth personally, but I just thought to keep it simple today, we're going to do black and white. And then next week, I will have all of these different designs. They'll be nice and dry, and I'm going to be able to come over it with paint next week and really 
just see what if, what if, what if, you know, what if. And then my goal is to take my favorite of those and blow it up and make it into an actual detailed designed painting. This, you know, in this class situation is taking a long time. But if you were to just do this at home in your own studio, you can get knock out a bunch of these in a matter of minutes, truthfully. Let them dry a little bit if you're using acrylics. Or you can just do them with pens or pencils, whatever you want to do. And then doing a couple little color studies to like, what if it was, you know, a sunset? What if it was sunrise, which is often a little cooler feeling? What if it was midday? What if it was stormy? What if it was winter? What if it was fall? All of those things that I can test really quickly. We're just trying to take the, not, I don't want to say the guess, well, kind of taking the guesswork out of our future painting so that we have a fun, interesting, good idea moving forward. Does that make sense to everybody? Hopefully you guys aren't rolling your eyes. Ah, oh, more thumbnails, more preliminary sketches. I'm gonna do a screen share one more time. Michael, because, are those yep. surfaces um, cardboard or wood? Yeah, they're that crappy cardboard with canvas wrapped around it that you can buy in like big old packs. The mini canvas, uh, mini canvases or, yeah. Yeah, so I've got, I just, especially when I'm teaching on location, I just buy stacks of them so that the students can, um, you know, have them, buy them from me. But they're a lot of fun because I'm not worried. I'm not going to sell it, you know, at least not in a gallery situation. I might sell it directly. Um, but uh it's um, because it's on that cardboard, it's, you know, it's not fully archival. It's um, what is going on? All right. So I just want to show you guys really quickly. And I apologize to the students that have been with me before. This is a quick, quick, quick story. I, I'll, I'll make it fast. There's long versions you can find online. Uh, it's a sad story um, about why I made this up. It's called a self critique before, midway, and at the end. Uh, All right, so I had a, I got invited very last minute to do a big show. Um, they another artist had bowed out like two or three weeks before the show. They asked me if I could, you know, paint enough paintings to fill up at least one, maybe two of the walls. I stupidly said yes, um, with even though I had no paintings. Just thinking I could fill the space, I decided very quickly that if I do big paintings, it'll be much easier to fill the space than a couple of small paintings. I just attacked the canvases. Um, and by the end of the first week, I realized I had three big, dumb paintings. The design wasn't there. Nothing had been thought out. I just was very exuberant. I just jumped at it. I just um, I didn't do any of the preliminary work. And I now I'm down to two weeks to get the show going or, you know, something like that. And it really just reinforced how important thinking and designing is in our work. Um, I have stacks of little paintings to my right over here where I literally just get so excited. I jump at them. I get them started. But none of them are going to, you know, it's going to take a lot of work to get, make them into anything because the design's not there. The the I, I just didn't have a complete and full idea. I do believe very much within our work, we need to have a conversation with our paint and be willing to make changes and do fun things and, you know, respond during the painting process. But if we can use our analytical side a little bit more at the beginning of the painting, it frees us up. And I promise you this, a little bit of the boring at the beginning makes the painting more fun. And there's a number of different ways that I approach that. We'll talk about some of it next week with color and things. But I made this check sheet for myself. And now I recently started sharing it with students. And it uh, there's a whole bunch of information here um, we'll share. And again, I apologize to students who were with me last term because I shared this then. But I 
if I don't fill this out, I think about each one of these questions as I'm starting my painting, all right? What is the theme, idea, or concept? What do we wish to communicate? This affects every other decision, the subject, mood, palette, and composition, right? Is this a sky painting? Is it a, you know, is it about the creek? Is it about the field? Is it about the trees? Is it about, you know, color? Is it about mood? What is it that's drawing me in or makes me want to paint this scene? Write that down. Make a bunch of copies of this for yourself. Have a stack of them in your studio or near your, all right? Design and composition, that's what we're talking about right now. Value distribution and structure, also what we're talking about right now. Color and temperature shifts, that's what we're gonna play with next week. Edges, that will come into my final painting, but it's a, a painting with hard edges versus soft edges or lost and found edges, feels very different from each other. You know, some acrylic painters have lots and lots of hard edges, you know, no, no soft, fuzzy edges. I love soft, fuzzy edges. Uh, I have maybe too many in my paintings. Um, I often want my paintings to be contemplative, kind of meditational. So I lean in towards that. But there's times when I want my paintings to be, like I said, a fiesta, not a siesta. I want it to be a party on the canvas. I want it to wake up a room. I want it to demand space. For other ones, I want them to sit back and compliment the furniture or to compliment the nice cup of tea in the morning or whatever it is. Um, paint quality and feel. All right, am I gonna use thick application of paint or am I gonna use a thin application of paint? Am I gonna be working up slowly in glazes? All these things I should start to be thinking about in the beginning. Uh, towards the end of the painting, I will be, start to look at what were the strengths because no, no painting is, you know, you don't hit any paintings fully out of the park. They're not full successes and, you know, some, but they're also not full failures. And if, and what I want you guys to really, really, really learn in this class is that every painting, and you guys have heard this before, every painting is an experiment and you can't fail an experiment. You can only learn. And every painting is towards the next painting. Every painting is about the next painting. If we keep learning, then we're never failing, right? Because paintings hurt our feelings constantly. For whatever reason, they don't work out. They're always, you know, doing something a little bit, or we experiment a little bit too hard. We try something new, which I'm always urging you guys to do, because that's how we learn. I want you guys to be playful, to be experimental, and to go for it. But just know that there's, I'm only grading you on the fact that you're doing it. Paint time is the most important thing. And then learning. So then I can write down, what were my weaknesses in this painting? You know, maybe my values were a little weak. Maybe I just didn't have dark enough darks or light enough lights or all my edges were too soft and fuzzy and there's no real focus. Or what was my strengths in this painting? Wow, look at this new color scheme I came up with, with the peaches against pale green. Who would have thought that would work? That's really interesting. I'll be able to use that, put that into my data banks for future paintings. Um, so, and then creativity. Am I challenging myself, right? It's very easy for somebody like me who literally makes his living on selling paintings to fall back on paintings that I know will sell. And that's just not interesting for me. It's not fun. I had a couple of years when my daughter was young and money was tight that I did. I felt like I became a machine. I just like, if I paint Haystack Rock, if I paint uh, Mount Hood, if I paint, you know, all these things, if I paint these colors, they'll sell. And that was great to make money. And I, you know, lucky to do what I do, but my creativity was lacking and I felt like uh, just a cog in a machine. And so it's important to me Maybe not every single time, but a lot of the time that I'm pushing myself. Underneath that, um, and again, this is under the handouts in the Padlet page, you can see more about like, if you're like, what does he even mean by that? I wrote some descriptions of what those different things mean or what you could possibly write about. Underneath that, at the very bottom, this was the part that was really important for me, waking up on um, Saturday morning after wasting a week and realizing I just... I, I was too, my, my ego was too big. I was too full of myself. I didn't think about things and just, I, 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 it hurt. It really, really hurt my everything. It hurt my ego. It hurt my self-esteem. 
And so I then Saturday morning, I woke up after a really bad night's sleep, and I wrote this little tiny note to myself. And it's Michael Orwick's, I like to talk about myself in third person, evidently. Michael Orwick's steps to building a successful foundation and painting. All right. I want you to take this and make it your own. These steps are my steps. <laughs> you can't have them. No, I'm just kidding. These steps are my steps and they might work for you, but they might not. There may be other things that you need to add or things that you can get rid of. Um, but this is how I approach a painting, not to ensure success, but to increase the likelihood of success. No painting is ever a sure thing. I'm sorry. But here it is. Michael Lorwick steps to building a successful foundation in painting. Number one, collect. Gather references for subject, design, and colors, mood, and theme. This is often multiple influences or as many as needed that help me to clarify my plan for my work. What excites me about this idea? What am I hoping to convey? What feeling am I hoping to elicit from the audience, right? I think we underestimate the importance of collection. A lot of people just have one bad photo. I will oftentimes have like five photos, three books open, magazines torn up. I'll have a certain song that I've chosen that I'll play on repeat that has the theme and the feel. It's important that I have it as much figured out. Again, it's going to change, of course, while I'm doing it. But have multiple influences, have multiple photos, have multiple sketches, whatever it is that you need to feel secure moving forward. Plan, sketch, thumbnails with paints, pens, or pencils. You no, use no tan, which simply means black and white without a grayscale, or limited values to see and feel the strong underlying design and structure. Edit, edit, edit and redesign, looking for flow and sexy shapes. I keep meaning to uh, get rid of sexy shapes, but uh, it means something to me because that's what the term my teacher used to use in college. Um, but you could think elegant shapes or whatever shapes are important. If it's a jagged or angular painting, it'll have different shapes. If my paintings are often soft shapes, I love domes like umbrella forms in my paintings. You'll see that a lot. There's just different things I'm drawn to. I love the S-curve. Uh, and again, that's all of us are going to be different. We're all drawn towards different elements in paintings. But that's what we're going to be doing today is plan and test. We've done collect. We've got our photos. And then we're going to collect color references next week. And I'll show you how we use those. But plan and test. Test. Small scale painting and or color chart. Again, that'll be what we do next week, which can be semi-abstract, meaning I can do it really loosely. I do not have to worry too much about getting every branch, leaf, piece of grass. These colors that coexist and, oh, how do these colors coexist and do they feed into the desired feeling of the painting? Start the painting. Properly prepare the desired surface and let it dry. Begin with the underlying value plan and structure. Establish light and shadow families. This is the foundation of the painting and the most important part. That is for me. That is for me, I'm very much a value-based painter. Lights and darks are the most important. I found that if my lights and darks are established really well and my design is there, I can go buck wild with colors and have a great time. Other people literally start with colors, um, but just learn how you, what is the most comfortable for you and what works best for you. Paint, build up painting thin to thick. With oil paints, for those of you who are oil painters in the group, painting from thinner paint to thicker paint, meaning you can use a little bit of paint thinner at the beginning, just a little bit. We don't want it runny. You can, you know, that'll help the paint to spread. You can cover big areas. Um, and then I will add either more paint or I may begin to add a medium, like an extender, like Galkid or Gams not Gamsol, Gamsol paint there, a Galkid or uh, any of the paint mediums into my paint as I'm building them up. Um, you want the earlier layers to dry faster. I also paint from dark to light. So then it often means that my dark layers are thinner so I can build up the lights on top quite quickly. And it also helps with photography. 
um, when I go to photograph my work, if I have really thick, dark paint, it is very difficult to uh, photograph because it's very shiny. So anyways, uh, build up the painting thin to thick. Reminder to eventually use lots of paint. And again, that's a reminder for myself because I paint quite thin and I want to start using more paint. And my wife very much wants me to start using more paint. Every time she comes up to look at my paintings, her first critique without fail is more paint. There, and let there be a physicality and texture to the loaded up brushwork. Don't overmix or blend too much. Again, notes for myself. When you watch me paint, you'll see oftentimes that I'm a bit of a blender or a scrubber with my brush. It does lean and help lend towards the style of painting that I'm known for, but I definitely would like to do a bit less of that. Um, I feel like it's a bit of a crutch for me at this time. But again, that's just so in, within these, add your own notes, whatever is important to you at the time and what you're working on at this stage of your uh, artistic journey. <clears throat> Very important, something nobody or so many of you guys do not do, especially if you sit when you paint, get away, <laughs> get away, step back often to see the full picture, set it aside or take a break from it at least 50 for at least 15 minutes to get fresh eyes. This is important so you can give it an honest, loving critique. If we just keep painting and if you're anything like me, you're just in love with it, it's your beautiful, beautiful baby, you need that 15 minutes to come back and go, you know what, that baby's, baby's got a lumpy head and uh, it's very splotchy and uh, you know, uh, hopefully it'll grow up to be a beautiful adult, but right now. Um, so you just need that time to get away and observe it. Um, you can do different techniques by like looking in mirrors. A lot of times I'll take a photo with my camera and just seeing it on a screen, it looks so differently. Sometimes I'll just turn the lights way down so it's very dim so I can see if my value structure is still holding up the painting. Lots of things like that. Uh, one more visit at least. A lot of times I think I'm done. And then when I force myself to do one more visit, it's really beneficial. You know, you don't want to overwork, but one more visit at least. Fix what needs fixing. <laughs> what jumped out of place or incorrect? Good enough is not good enough. And that's for me. For you guys, good enough is good enough. I want you guys to just paint and keep painting. How do we make this great? Make it so good they can't ignore you. That's a Steve Martin quote that I adopted. This can also be a time to ask for feedback or a critique from others you trust and respect their opinions and taste. All right, then these are for me, depending on where you are making this into a career or if you're sharing your work online. Ship, take high quality photos, make a short video of it with a description of my why and or how and what I hope to bring to the viewer. Get it out to the galleries or offer it for sale on my website, then promote. Share, let the people see what you have made. Ask them to share it. The world needs what you are making. The more beauty in the world, the better off we all are. Start another one. Learn what the painting had to teach and move on. Keep painting, underline. All right, I ap apologize and appreciate you guys who have heard that maybe once, twice before. But I think it's unbelievably important, even just me reading it again. I'm just like, ah. That's pretty clever. I should follow those rules. I'd be a better painter. <laughs> All right. Let's start painting, shall we? Anybody? Um, yeah, let's go ahead and take uh, one more break for five minutes, and then we'll have one hour to do the paintings. Um, everybody doing OK? Any questions? Any comments? I had a quick question, and I may be jumping the gun. Um, for our assignment for next week, are we just to do drawings or do you want us to do preliminary drawings and preliminary paintings like what you're going to be working on today? I'm going to leave that up to you. Um, most people don't do preliminary paintings, but I sure found it great. And the reason I'm going to possibly suggest it to you is that next week we can color them. Okay. Um, so I like it because this is the same way that it's like a miniature version of the big painting I'm going to do. I'll probably use a similar technique to build up my painting. Um, so it's up to you. If you want to do just four thumbnail sketches, 
with a pen, charcoal, whatever, pencils, that is completely fine. Um, but you may find that doing, and I'll show you how loose and gestural and fun these can be. And there's another thing that's really great about doing these little paintings that you don't care about is you can work on your brushwork. You're very liberated. So for mm -hmm. those of you who are like, I just don't know how to paint more, like more impressionistically or more loosely, this is your opportunity to really just kind of dash on some paint. And we're going to talk a little bit <laughs> when we get back from the break about that, about different painting styles and brushwork and how to use those. So yeah, let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, we'll be back at 1135 if that works for you. Mm -hmm. 